So our, our next uh, recipient, um, I mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, the significance of that draft class, and uh, I think it's important to, to, to go through it again, and Mickey helped me out, though, but obviously Reggie in the first round, uh, the second round pick, uh, we actually traded down um, middle of that second round four to five spots and acquired Jeff Fain and selected Alabama's Roman Harper. And that was a pretty good round where we got two players. Um, I don't know that we had a third round pick. Um, I don't think we did. So day one ended and we went to bed that night, um, you know, kind of with the board listed as to how we're, we're going to start the next day. And um, we went, we went home with the idea we were going to select Owen Daniels tight end from Wisconsin. He also just ironically happened to be from my hometown. So the morning starts, we're eating, eating breakfast. We've got one pick here. Houston Texans are going to select and we're going to be on the clock. I'm actually on the phone with Owen Daniel. We're talking. I'm saying, you know, here in about five minutes, we're excited. And all of a sudden, you know how you're on the other end of caller ID anymore. Sometimes you can't hear it, but there was a time where you just felt like click. And he's like, one second, coach. And he came back. He said, coach, you won't believe this. And he said, the Texans are going to draft me. And the odds of that happening, and, and you just sit in the draft room, and I'm like, are you kidding me? It's five till eight in the morning. <laughs> All right. And this was a slam dunk. We were, you know, there was only one team. And so, all right, we hung up. Sure enough, the Texans selected Owen Daniel. Um, we traded down with the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, we acquired Hollis Thomas. Uh, they drafted Max Gene Gillis. And then we selected out of uh, Bloomsburg, Jari Evans. Um, so sometimes, look, it, it, that was a win-win, really, the careers both players had, but uh, a, a, a huge, a huge break for us in getting a, a, a fantastic uh, starting guard, potentially Hall of Fame guard. And so fifth round, he's going to be an honorary member of this draft class because he, I don't know that he goes into our Hall of Fame. Um, certainly we'll invite him back because he lives here half the year, but Rob Ninkovich uh, out of Purdue, we had Rob – uh, twice. And the last time I told him, I thought he was going to be a long snapper. And then he went on to win two Super Bowls <laughs> with the New England Patriots playing outside linebacker and, and basically uh, having a fantastic career. So we didn't have the right vision. Um, in the sixth round, we, dr we drafted uh, the Fred Blitnikoff winner out of Oregon State. I believe his name was Mike Haas. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike was a real productive receiver, uh, a player we had, 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 had seen a lot on film, uh, obviously was decorated. And uh, then in the first of the seventh round selections, we took Zach Streif. And that leads us to our compensatory selection, Marcus Colston. So in these draft meetings, it's easy to, to focus your energies on the, on the first round. Uh, you, you know, Typically, the media, most most of the fan base does. It's hard to s speculate into the later rounds. And at that time, Curtis Johnson, our receiver coach, had seen his tape. Now, mind you, it was somewhat grainy. <laughs> so every once in a while, you'll you'll get a, a tape from a smaller school, and you'll try to you know we spent a lot of time trying to locate the number, what socks is he wearing, something that stands out. And so CJ had a real strong high opinion. Johnny Morton the same way, a high opinion. I know one of our area scouts did. And and look, we're, I'll be honest with you, you, you do look for traits. So we're not in that room just throwing darts at names in the seventh round. But he had these traits. Now the route tree was limited. The offense he played in. Uh, you didn't get to see a lot of what we were going to see for the next however, ma however many years that he excelled here. In fact, we weren't going to see that at the rookie camp either. All right. <laughs> that rookie camp, we were inside, outside, inside, outside, and this Mike Haas was catching a ton of balls. I mean, I'm telling you, playing the slot, and meanwhile, Marcus – it, it, I don't know if it was the heat here or if it was his back. It was a combination of a few things. But between, you know, Johnny, Johnny Moe and CJ were like drill sergeant one and drill sergeant two. I mean, the first person you hear at our practice 
in those Joe Horn didn't know what to think, but it was Curtis Johnson. All right. And, and it, it became kind of legendary each year. It, it didn't matter who the receivers were. And so, man, I know there was a point. I heard Zach Streif's point last year in his speech, but I know there was this point with Marcus where he was thinking, man, is, is this it? Is, am I in the NFL and do I, do I belong? But his spring, I would say, was just somewhat uh, okay. The most amazing thing happened, though, throughout that summer and into training camp, and I would say the early weeks of training camp, Deuce, we were waiting on your knee. You were on a pitch count. Drew Brees, we were waiting on his shoulder. He was on a pitch count. All right. Reggie was doing Gatorade commercials, and he was rolling. <laughs> he was doing outstanding. All right. Dante Stallworth, truth be known, was kind of bugging me a little bit. And he and I laugh about that to this point. But I mean, that was that was kind of a little bit, uh, I would say, with some some grief and or some uh, frustration. And and all of a sudden. This Colston each day just boom, just keeps making pars and birdies, just keep putting practices together where, you know, it goes from. I can remember the first deep any caught on the grass field that was 60 yards long and we had the arena ball blow up sidelines in case you went out of bounds. These things caught you. And I remember that first week and then that second week. And at some point into that first month of training camp feeling like, hey, we, we got our starting split in. We got our starting split in. And and look, I said this already. I, man, I was ready to trade Dante Stallworth. All right. And and again, he and I have a relationship now where it's easy for me to say that. But now it became much easier. And to see then the way this player played not only in his rookie year, but I'm telling you, it was boom, the most consistent. You knew exactly what you were going to get. I can recall his first his first touchdown catch at Cleveland, uh, if you were expecting a, a fun end zone dance or anything, you were just going to get a flip. <laughs> you know, in, in the pylon he caught against the Green Bay Packers, we were down 13 nothing. We came back and won that game in week two to, to lead up to uh, Governor of the game you were referencing. And to watch the career he had in the, in the um, I want to use the right word, I don't know if it's symbiotic relationship or that that cohesiveness he and Drew shared that was was earned post practice. Um, it was earned uh, throughout countless days at Millsaps, um, and I know Drew would say the same thing. But man, there the consistency and the professionalism and 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 knowing exactly what you were going to get week in and week out. And mind you, what you were going to get was the all-time leading receiver in the history of this organization. And he had, he, had, he had excellent hands. Occasionally, on occasion, twice a year, he'd have not a hard drop, but an easy one that would just go dump. And it was, it was somewhat unusual because it didn't happen often. His catch rate, uh, ratio was phenomenal. But when he would have one of these, like I would turn and and I would want to give, you know, I don't know. And so Marcus was smart enough to where he would exit the field opposite of where I was always. <laughs> and it became somewhat frustrating. Because <laughs> I think we were on cords then, and you can actually see this take place in the Super Bowl. <laughs> We ran a gap play action pass, deep 18 yard hook. The ball kind of came here, boom, on the ground. And then right away, like he just kind of moved across the 40 yard line. And I was down at the 30, the other 30. And, I, and then I would be like weaving through players to, to, <laughs> to try to find them. That didn't happen often. Um, that didn't happen often. He, was very humble in how he played, very respected as a teammate. And uh, and again, as I mentioned with Reggie and, and I'm mentioning with him, I mean, I, I just, as a coach, it, it was, it was, you know, you, you get three years, the first time coaches, you, you, gotta, you have to do something in three years. 
you know, I remember telling our team this, and these guys might remember this, history or what we call, um, oh, that term we use for culture, I referenced the Steelers. And I said, you guys would consider this organization one that has winning ways. And yet, if you looked at 1970, 71, 72, and, and Chuck Knoll was there, there were, some, there were some lean seasons and prior to that. And so very quickly, what we know, or what I grew up with as an organization that became one of a winning culture, a winning tradition, happened um, not over 40 years, but happened over two or three really good, outstanding draft classes. Um, and man, they made that change. And we referenced that at that point. And, and so to, to be able to visit with some of these players now and, and, and to personally thank these players now, because for a young coach, um, there's certain breaks you need. And, and man, there are a lot of talented players that don't end up in the right system that we never hear a lot about their careers. And I think there are a lot of talented coaches that so 